Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica, and today I want to talk to you about webcomics. And I want to share with you some of the learnings that I had when I started to create my own webcomic with Ember.js. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you, if you are also like a little bit of an artist at heart, also have like a better idea what you can do on the web right now to actually create your own illustrator stories. Uh, first, a few words about myself for my conference credibility. <laughs> Trying to build it up again. So when I came here to Amsterdam, I actually had to fly from Berlin. Here in the background, you can see the beautiful skyline of the city with the Alexander Tower in the background. And actually, in the five years that I've been living there, I slowly but steadily came to the realization that I'm the one single person in Berlin who didn't come here for the techno scene, <laughs> but like um, for the vegetarian food instead. I'm really fond of that. So if you're a vegetarian, you should definitely check it out in Berlin. It's the best. Or like probably even, even if you're not vegetarian, you should check it out. I'm also a software engineer working at Simplabs. Um, as Marco already said, we are a European web consultancy helping clients build um, apps in Phoenix, Phoenix Elixir, Ruby Rails, and also JavaScript Ember.js. And also, I'm a member of the Ember learning team. And there, for example, I also help with the Ember Times, which is a weekly newsletter that actually keeps you up to date with what is going on in Emberland right now. So if you haven't subscribed yet, now is the time. <laughs> and yeah, this is it with the pitch right now. And let's actually get more closer to the topic of today. Why I'm interested in comics is probably a very intuitive reason. I am a really big fan of comics. And actually, when I was a kid, I also really liked to read different stories and graphic novels. And I was really intrigued by this idea of trying to create a storyline through pictures and images and just like trying to complement it with text. And in fact, like, I actually am not really sure why I picked this picture because like, I never really read all this DC and Marvel stuff. Like, I was a really big Sailor Moon fan, but yeah, I don't know, maybe, maybe this relates more to you, I'm not sure. And in fact, nowadays we still have these printed comics and we still have like pictures and illustrations printed into books for us to pick up in a bookstore and take along with us on a bus ride or if we're just like sitting at home. But in fact, now, if you think about it, it's like, it's like quite some time that we actually did this and it's already 2018, so the question is, why do we do so many things on the web, but why don't we do comics yet? How is it that actually there's not so much around yet where you can read a cool superhero story on a website or a web app, or maybe like also a native app on your phone? In fact, there are a couple of examples. For example, I really like this one particular webcomic. Uh, it's called Netroid. Uh, it's a very kind of fun, um, adventure story around like different characters, for example, this pigeon and also this bear who looks like a potato and he's also caught bear tato because of that. And they are really kind of like really snippy and very short comic strips that you can read. And in fact, the creator of this comic, he has his own website where he regularly publishes any of these comics. And here we can already see a quite common pattern in web comics as they are done today. It's usually just like a PNG or a JPEG that someone has created, maybe like a sketchbook, or maybe they even have like hand drawn it and scanned it in into their computer and then uploaded it to, for example, a private website. And I think this is actually quite a straightforward format to do it, but um, later on I also want to explain why I think it's also still a bit limited. Other artists might also use social media very regularly to actually publish their comics. I'm a really big fan of the comics and the stories of Ruby ETC. And she, for example, uses Twitter but also Instagram to publish her stories and um, use it as a public channel for what she wants to publish. And I think this is also very straightforward for short comic strips because a tweet is nothing more than just like a snippet of what you're thinking right now. And I think for these kind of comics, this is also a really great medium. Last but not least, I also want to show an example that I believe goes a little bit closer in the direction of what we will do on the web with comics in the future. In fact, there's this really cool um, installation, first of all, but also comic application that readers can use to actually follow a graphic novel that has been produced by Marietta Ren. And maybe I can also play this video, just that you have like a, a small insight into it. It's a very cool art project that has been constructed by a large group of people or quite some time and has been published in 2016. And it's a very 
yeah, I would say like very immersive story because it tries to leverage different technologies that we currently have available on the web into an experience that lets people really try to further explore very haptively, for example, like on an iPad, the story and the characters. And the user can, for example, scroll all the way through the story to see how it further evolves. And I think this is very, yeah, this is very kind of like an interesting concept to think about, that we can actually do this and we realize we start to go beyond the borders that we had with uh, printed media like books. So. And what I want to say as well is, you can actually do it too. This is what I was thinking when I saw that. I was like, oh, actually, maybe I could also do something like that. And then, yeah, I kind of like started now. In fact, I was thinking about, first of all, when I started, what is the anatomy of like a comic? What is a comic actually consisted of and where could I actually start? And I was thinking, actually, I would like to have like a quite traditional comic, like something that resembles a bit like the experience that I would have in a printed book. So I thought about, okay, like, if I look at a printed book, a printed comic book, how is it actually like, how is it actually composed? What does it actually consist of? So if you look at that, we realize, yeah, okay, we have several pages, of course. It makes kind of like sense, right? You can just like skim through them, and each of these pages has like different panels, and in each of these panels, you have like certain content, uh, pictures, or maybe some text, um, maybe some things that people are saying in these panels to further drive the story. And I was thinking, okay, like, let's maybe start like from the top down. Um, let's try to create actually a comic page in my MB application that I now want to build. So I was thinking, okay, like there's this comic page, it should hold several, uh, several panels. And then I would also realize, okay, like probably if I want to start to structure it, like similar as in many other MB applications that I've written, everything should probably start from a route. So I would think about how I would try to structure this further both like data-wise, but also application-wise. And I was thinking, ah, oh, it would actually make sense if I had like several pages and they can be arbitrarily long because I know I'm not very limited by the end of a paper page as in a book, but on the web, actually, people can scroll all the way down. And sometimes they also are very, yeah, very comfortable with the idea to scroll for a long seconds, minutes, maybe not hours, but quite a long time. So we're thinking, okay, maybe I can even pack like a whole chapter into it, right? So I would, for example, create like in my router a configuration um, that I wanted to have like this route with chapters with an overview. And then also in each of these chapters, I have like a separate route where I can also define which kind of like configuration I want to load for this specific page or chapter. And um, yeah, interestingly, I was first of all thinking just like to fill it up with fixtures, but I realized actually if I want to in the long run further work on it, it might make sense to also have like a small backend that actually serves me this configuration for the pages as we will see, see in a bit. And then later on, of course, if you have your route, you can then just like simply use the store to actually make a request for the specific resource. I have like a JSON API um, uh, compliant um, yeah, resource on my Rails backend, and therefore it's as easy as just like writing, this gets to find uh, my chapter with the ID. And then, of course, we actually have to get started with the content, right? So let's create some comic panels. I found it really interesting in my application that I was thinking, first of all, okay, let's, let's maybe think, like, how do actually like other comic artists do it? And I realized, okay, probably the easiest one is just like maybe creating like an yeah, just like a um, square and it just like, yeah, show an image, right? This is what you usually do if you do a comic. Because if you look at comics, you realize that mm, the way comics are actually constructed is very, yeah, it seems a bit artificial if you think about it, right? So let's look, for example, at this comic strip. We see uh, in this comic strip with Kevin uh, and Hobbes, the character sitting in one image, and then over the course of it, we see how yeah, the kind of like uh, scenery changes. Suddenly he is jumping out of a window and suddenly you can see how someone else picks him up. And through kind of like going through these different pictures, we realize that we get like an um, impression of the actual motion of the actual story in the pictures just by seeing all the images one after another. But of course, this is not something that happens in real life. It's something like an 
more like an abstraction that we have to consider to actually convey motion or to convey like a story that evolves over a timeline because we are limited by the medium which is yeah paper or like print. And I was thinking, okay, like I can also do something like that. Maybe I'll just like draw different pictures and they are a little bit different and then people can kind of like maybe imagine, depending on my drawing skills, that the water is moving. Last but not least, of course, we, we are not that limited on the web. And thinking about all the different tools we currently already have available to make different things possible, not only the depiction of images, but also animations, we realize we can actually be a bit more creative. We can actually do a little bit more. And like there were a lot of like approaches, actually heavily used approaches in the past to actually make this happen, right? I, I won't name any names, but everyone who's a little bit over, over 30 kind of like really knows right now, right? <laughs> But in fact, there are a lot of new things nowadays, and today I want to go a little bit deeper into the Web Animations API. I find the Web Animations API really promising. Uh, maybe like a quick shot, a show of hands, like who who's worked with the Web Animations API before? It's, oh, okay, it's a little bit light up here, but I think it's not too many. Okay. Um, yeah, it's very interesting. It's like a quite experimental API yet it already gives a lot of capabilities to actually create very dynamic and also easily to synchronize animations. And the polyfills that currently exist are also quite valuable, so even if you wanted to create an animation experience for someone on, uh, who doesn't use like, the latest Chrome or the latest Firefox, this is definitely possible. So the capabilities are actually there. And yeah, let's maybe just like, have a quick look how the API in general uh, works like. So if you haven't worked with the Web Animations API before, it might be useful to know that everything is based on keyframe effects for actually creating and configuring animations. A keyframe effect is, um, is an entity that actually allows us to, first of all, define what kind of animation should be uh, composed, like, um, for example, which kind of like properties, CSS properties, should be manipulated on an element. It also defines on which element this should happen, so we can animate any kind of like dumb notes in our application. And also with the options, we also have a large set of different things we can further configure to make this animation as flexible as possible. The keyframes actually remind us very, very much as of the CSS3 keyframes that you might be familiar with if you already tinkered with animations in CSS3. So it looks very similar, and any kind of like um, CS app property that you can think of is also available for you here in the um, uh, Web Animations API. It's interesting to note that there are some properties that are more or less performant, right? So if you, for example, want to do a lot of animations, it might make sense to actually use any of these that are also, um, yeah, kind of, um, uh, how does it, how's it called? Supported in browsers very easily. So for example, transforms, but also opacity, any of these properties, I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't suggest to uh, do a lot of animations regarding yeah, positions, for example. Also with the options, we have a lot of um, other availability to configure it further, as I already said. And this is also very similar to the CSS3 animations API. So if you, for example, wanted to use any kind of like other thing, for example, the easing function, this is also available in the web animations API. And last but not least, you put all of this together into a keyframe effect. And finally, you have your configuration for one specific um, animation that is related to this specific element. And let's actually see how this plays out. Like, how do we actually embed this into our application? In my application, for, for example, I was thinking it would be, first of all, really cool to have the ability to animate different panels, but also I would like to have the flexibility that if I, for example, had like a foreground picture and a background picture, that I could animate them separately. So I was thinking, okay, maybe like each kind of like comic panel could consist of different layers. So let's, for example, start with setting up a specific layer. Here I create a component, a panel layer component, that actually now allows me to do all the setup and the configuration for this specific animation in the component itself. And depending on how further I abstract away different properties of this animation, I can also make this component very reusable. So this is really cool. 
And here, for example, I created this component. Here I'll show like you an excerpt of that. And here I would, for example, create a setup method that would, for, for me, actually create this keyframe effect. Also interesting to note, I didn't depict it here, but in animation options, I can also configure how fast it should actually be executed, how often it should be executed. And uh, in this instance, for example, because I'm using sprite images to actually make the animation, I'm also using a specific easing function called step, which will allow me to gradually but incrementally go through the sprite sheet. And then last but not least, if I am actually want to, yeah, kind of like do the setup in each layer, I could then call this method and also call another method that you see here called onSetup that I've passed down from the comic panel component, which is the parent component of the panel layer. And um, this is maybe not so easy to see why I actually need to do this, but we will see this in a bit when we have a talk about like different uh, several layers in a com comic panel component. Now we actually have a look at the comic panel. Here we see the action that we have passed down. Uh, this actually allows us to add all of the effects of all the panel layers that are available in the comic panel to a certain array. And interestingly, because um, Ember actually makes sure that the did insert element hook is only exec um, is always executed first for the child views and then later on for the parent views, I actually have the ability to do any kind of like other set of work for which I require all of the keyframe effects of the layers to already be available to do in the did insert element hook of the parent component, which is comic panel. And so here, for example, I can now create this new setup that I need to actually be able to synchronize all of my animations. And in the Web Animations API, this entity is called Group Effect. A group Effect allows me to actually gather different animations uh, in one instance. And then, for example, I can do like things like playing and pausing and also resetting it on the timeline of my animation whenever I want together in one go. So I'm creating this effect. And then later on, I will actually call the document timeline, or I will use it to actually create an animation, which is also part of the Web Animations API, um, to actually allow me to set my animations along to be available for playing and pausing. And then last but not least, I will actually take this animation and set it on my component, so it's like always available whenever I would like to, uh, whenever I would like to execute it. And then once we actually have done that, we can finally call methods like this get animation play or this get animation pause in our component whenever we want, for example, through user interaction to execute the animation or yeah, to just like pause it again. And I think this is this is not so Ember specific yet, right? Because you realize, okay, like I could take an index HTML or whatever and just like throw everything in, I wouldn't have to do all this component stuff maybe necessarily, although I think the componentization already helps me a lot with the usability of these layers and also configuring them more easily. But I think the really interesting thing comes in if we think about like application state and also user interaction. And I realize in Ember there are many things that I easily get out of the box where I otherwise would have to worry a lot about. So I get like, for example, the easy separation of concerns, for example, with the components, but also with the routes that allows me to easily enter different app states and not having to check when I should actually load a specific chapter and the specific configuration. It's very easy for me to set up. The conventions also make it quite easy, first of all, for me to yeah, get a handle of like maybe more complex systems. If I maybe end up with like 10 different layer components, in a setup where I wouldn't use like a very convention-driven framework like Ember, it might be very different uh, of an experience for me to maintain that. But as for the least, I also think the conventions of a configuration um, aspect also really drives into the community aspects and how other people and other developers in community can really support me in creating this application. And I think the add-on ecosystem, which is like very livid in the Ember community, is a great, great factor for me to actually still have kind of like a fun experience doing all of that. And I think this benefit from the community, for example, shines really nicely in the next example where I try to find out, okay, how can I make this interaction with the animation a bit more, a bit more immersive, a bit more yeah, intuitive for the user? I was thinking it would be really cool if, for example, 
you would um, go to the application and then as you scroll through, you would see that different panels suddenly start to move. As you can see, for example, here with the uh, one to the left, but also with the one here at the bottom. And I thought it would be yeah, so much nicer than just like have everything running at once, right? To just like have this experience of, I don't know, very natural exploration of a web page and the user realizing, oh, there's something new. This is really interesting. So what I would start with uh, was like, um, just like looking, okay, like mm, maybe I can check how the scrolling is kind of like triggered at a specific time point and then I could listen to this event and then yeah, maybe I would probably also have to check at which height I'm currently at and then I would probably also have to check where the component is currently at and yeah, it kind of like got a little bit hairy but then I was like, okay, okay, let's maybe step back for a bit and maybe let's first check Ember Observer Let's go to the website and let's see, maybe there's an add-on for that, right? So it's probably the most common mantra that's talked about at every Ember, Ember event, but it's true. And actually I found an add-on called Ember and Viewport, which is a um, very nice add-on that exports a mix in that you can tangle in into your uh, components to actually make it available to have like certain hooks in your component that can be triggered once a component enters or exits a viewport. It's a really nice add-on uh, created by Sugar Pirate, and um, I had really a lot of fun with it, actually using it in this app. And specifically, I would, for example, use my comic panel component again, mix in this, uh, yeah, mix in, and then I would uh, use the did enter viewport and did exit viewport hooks that are provided by this specific add-on to actually simply play and pause my animation as I go. And this was actually, yeah, very straightforward. I was really surprised, actually. And um, yeah, I think this kind of like gave me more of an idea of what is actually already possible in the, not only in the Ember sphere and not only in the web application sphere, but also in the yeah, in the web sphere in general. Because I feel there are a lot of possibilities already out there that we can use to leverage um, yeah, certain concepts that we already have. For example, yeah, let's maybe do a really cool illustrative comic that also responds to user interaction. But I also feel we sometimes, yeah, we sometimes don't really spend, spend time to explore these options. And I really hope that, um, yeah, my experience in my talk could also give you a bit more of an understanding that there's always a possibility for you to dive a dip further and actually find out what is currently out there. Because even if you still think, think back at the ages of Flash and think like, okay, like these ages are gone, it doesn't mean it really has to be this way. And I feel the web is actually a really good cool platform as it is already. And once we actually leverage the tools that are already there and try to dive deeper into how they actually work, we can create um, very incredible things. And last but not least, like, yeah, I just want to mention that I hope this gave you a better idea that there are a lot of tools, that uh, it's also really great to use any of them. You don't have to feel super compelled to stick to one specific one just because it's the one that you already use, but um, just whatever is out there. And of course, uh, most importantly, your imagination can get you also a long way in your quest to actually create your own web comics. And with that said, I would say thank you very much and have a great time at Emberfest.